order. So it would be... Yes, you are in the end. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is such a packed room. I hope everyone can definitely hear me. Our guests, our panelists are just sitting themselves down. Hello, um, Executive Vice President. <laughs> So, my name is Mariam Zaidi, um, I'm a Euroactive moderator, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Eurofa, the European Student Association debate, with Euroactive, of course, as their media partner. Now, if it isn't obvious, from the big screen there, we're discussing the future of industry in Europe, value chain resistance or dependence. What should be Europe's industrial strategy into the next legislature and beyond? Now, against the backdrop of the upcoming European elections, Many a debate are taking stock of what the EU should do next. How should it be plotting? Well, this debate is no different. We know that industry is the backbone of any economy. But with the world in permacrisis, we've seen the vulnerabilities and the exposure that the EU has. Let me rattle through a few of them. The COVID-19 pandemic delivered possibly the biggest value chain shock in recent memory. Next, of course, we've had the war in Ukraine and all of the... Um, supply chain disruptions, energy crises, cost of living crisis that's really hit people hard. We now have another geopolitical crisis in the form of the Middle East uh, crisis, which is also causing supply chain disruptions. And then, of course, we have the constant looming threat of climate change. Now, how does that impact Europe in terms of numbers? Well, 2023 was possibly one of the worst years on record for crude steel production, which is down 7% from 2022. Experts say that production has fallen even lower than the previous negative record from the financial crisis back in 2008. So that's really not good. Basic chemical production shrank by 8%, petrochemicals 10%, and then you've got cement going down by 1%. Also, part of emission reductions in the power sector are due to the economic downturn. So overall electricity production has declined by around 5%. And a 45% drop in fossil generation was actually due to demand reduction, while only 43%, according to the figure says, was due to increased wind and solar generation. So as I said, none of this sounds very good. But amongst all of the challenges, of course, we are optimists, especially Europeans. Um, so can the EU then find this opportunity and pivot towards an industrial policy that increases competition and clean innovation? There is a vision for industry in Europe in 2030, and the European Commission has identified key drivers for this success. Connected, clean and autonomous vehicles, which we will, of course, be talking about with one of our panellists, hydrogen technologies and systems, smart health, industrial internet of things, low CO2 emission industry and cyber security. But, and there's always a but, isn't there? In the words of the former ECB president and the former Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi, who's been tasked, of course, with this report that we're all looking forward to on the EU's competitive, competitiveness, he has said that it would take an enormous amount of money in a relatively short time to deal with the deep challenges the bloc is facing. We also now know that EU leaders are expected to call for a new European competitiveness deal and single market strategy at next week's European Council Summit. So with all of that, let's see what our speakers uh, have to say on all of this and what they think are the next steps for industry. It's my pleasure now to welcome the Eurofa president, uh, Henrik Adam. He's also the vice president of Tata Steel and chairman of the board of Tata Steel Netherlands Holding for his opening address, please. As a member of the European society and the steel industry, I think it's of key importance to speak out in the beginning. We are really committed to decarbonize our industry. I was born in one of the core areas of Europe where steel has been there forever, as ever I can recognize. However, I cannot imagine that we go forward without a decarbonized, but a deindustrialized Europe. Our products are looked for around the globe. Our technology was and is leading in many areas. The transition to green and clean wouldn't be possible without steel. Think about electric vehicles, transformers, wind towers. 
And I think to conserve and to grow our wealth, our prosperity, our economies in Europe, I think we need to have a right mix of services, but also of industrial production, where steel is and was and will be the core element of choice for designers, engineers around the globe. We have a chance to decarbonize, but also to grow our, our manufacturing, our industry by new products and new applications. But that doesn't happen in just continuing what we do so far. Today we are under big threats. Um, the European steel industry is the only one which has not grown but slowed down in the past decade. China and new economies have grown up a, a steel industry which is competitive. And they have also increased trade barriers which make our steel produced in Europe difficult to be exported. And so we have a double whammy in terms of a free trade inflow into Europe, unfair in many cases, and also difficulties to export steel uh, to other countries. And by that we have, I would say, we are looking into a perfect storm to decarbonize, which we want to, but also to deindustrialize. And we have by that, for that four main areas, which I consider a key for success. The first is, if we want to consider green electricity to be the key and the core element of future industry, future mobility, then we must have low and competitive cost for electricity in Europe. Trade measures in terms of trade defense or trade enabling is a key uh, on, a, on a fair and open, transparent matter. We want to decarbonize quickly. We are the, 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 uh, the, the first gl more or glo uh, larger economies who want to decarbonize across the globe. Do it quickly, uh, doesn't go without support and access to financial tools to create that uh, conversion. And finally, fourth amendment, we need to have green leading markets to support the application of European clean steel for products which are, as they were in the past, innovative, great, appreciated around the world, made with European clean steel. I think we have today a great forum to discuss what needs to be done. And I was asked earlier, do you have still faith in that we can do it? And yes, I have, because I see a growing moment, an inertia growing in terms of we need to act now. And it's time to act now. I think we have the ingredients, the tools, what we need to do. Now it's on us as Europeans to act. Thank you for coming, for joining, and over back to you. My pleasure. <laughs>
in the moment, and we are preparing for the big discussions taking place in the coming uh, weeks and months uh, uh, about, uh, indeed, uh, the future path of uh, Europe's uh, green transition. And the uh, essence uh, of uh, this debate, to put it in a nutshell, is how to achieve climate neutrality while preserving the competitiveness of our industry and ensuring transition which is socially fair and inclusive. Because as a politician, whatever you do, you need to have people with you. And it's critical that uh, industry's voice is properly heard uh, in uh, this uh, strategic uh, conversation. And as you rightly recalled, President von der Leyen and, uh, and I have been strengthening our engagement uh, with the industry and social partners in recent months uh, through events like the Clean Transition Dialogues. Yesterday, so far, we had the last one. Altogether, we have uh, nine of them. We had a pleasure to, to host uh, representatives of energy intensive industry, but we also had one specific event dedicated uh, just uh, to the uh, decarbonizations and the challenges uh, which are there ahead uh, of the uh, European steel industry. And I would like uh, to tell you that uh, for us, uh, be it on the political level, but I'm sure as uh, my good friend and colleague Kurt Fartenberg uh, will tell you, it's also very important for our directors general to, to have this exchange uh, among ourselves, with the representative in the industry, to listen to each other, to, uh, to network and uh, to interact. And uh, if I can give you one very clear insight what all these discussions are uh, clearly, clearly confirming, and that's the need uh, for the reinforced industrial approach that builds on the EU's industrial strategy and a green industrial uh, plan. Uh, and we believe that uh, through these uh, uh, fundaments uh, we can really work on reaching these three objectives at the same time. To be climate neutral by 2050, but also to increase competitiveness and resilience uh, of our industry and uh, uh, to achieve the transition that will be socially fair and inclusive. You've been, in your introductory remarks, referring very rightly to a uh, very difficult path uh, we went through over the last uh, five years. When we started uh, uh, with, a, uh, with the Green Deal, we didn't know that uh, a few months later we'll be faced with COVID, that we'll have uh, two wars so close to our uh, borders, which was unthinkable at that time. And on top of it, that we, we will have to go through the worst uh, energy prices, uh, crisis uh, uh, in a generation. And nevertheless, uh, 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 we managed, we made it through, and I think that it's a uh, uh, till great extent to our industry, which despite of all odds and these difficult um, situations uh, has proven that it's an uh, industry which is very competitive and very, very resilient. And we have to work on making it even stronger in the future. Tomorrow, the Commission will adopt a communication which is uh, taking stock of the clean transition uh, dialogues, which will feed into the debate uh, on strategic agenda. The leaders, the European uh, heads of states and government, will have uh, next week. And we see, of course, this, and, um, uh, this uh, uh, engagement uh, with the industry uh, as of vital importance, because clearly we know that there is no alternative to climate neutrality. There is no plan B to decarbonization, and therefore we very much uh, appreciate a uh, very clear statement and uh, a lot of progress and efforts which have been undertaken uh, by European uh, steel industry. Because what I want also to say very clearly, the decarbonization cannot be outsourced. And I would say it even, even more precisely, more clearly, um, and I would underline it, that uh, the European uh, economy of the future has to be built here in Europe. And we have to work very hard for it. This means that we have to maintain a strong industrial base. We have to ensure the resilience of our value chain. And we need and we must strengthen our strategic autonomy. However, our industry, as I was just uh, uh, mentioning a, a few seconds ago, has been hit hard by this energy crisis, but also by changing geopolitical 
and geoeconomical landscape. And still, uh, for example, in uh, all this, uh, I would say, new world arrangement has a key role to play as an industry essential for many ecosystem and uh, for the clean tech uh, value chains. And I will be not uh, now talking about the increased importance of the defense industry uh, for Europe's uh, future. And also, we know we are fully aware, and I can tell you that the representatives of the steel companies made it very clear in talking to us in our clean transition dialogues that uh, steel industry is a central part uh, of our economy uh, as a whole, producing turnover of some 125 billion euros a year, uh, accounting for more than 300,000 direct and more than one and a half million of indirect jobs, and that's a lot, and that's absolutely important. And therefore, it's quite clear that unfair competition, production over capacities, and unlimited uh, subsidies linked with local content requirements of our competitors, together with the high energy cost, have put the competitiveness of European industry at risk. And these uh, uh, challenges uh, do not only affect the steel, but other sectors, such as aluminium, cement, chemicals, and the list is, of course, much longer. So we must take care to avoid uh, decarbonization translating into de-industrialization. And I believe that uh, this will remain priority and at the top of the political agenda, whatever the outcome of the European elections uh, in June. Building on existing policy framework, we need to modernize uh, the single market and we need to fine tune our policy toolbox to provide European solutions to the challenges uh, facing our industry. In this way, we can safeguard uh, Europe's leading global position while furthering our decarbonization agenda. And that means ensuring the necessary supplies of sustainable and affordable clean energy, including hydrogen. Something that will require massive uh, investment, and I'm sure that uh, Mr. Draghi will have quite precise calculation in that regard. And we would need them not only in expanding renewable um, energy generation, but also in developing the necessary infrastructure in particular grids. Sometimes uh, when you see the figures how much uh, of uh, the investments and financial resources we are losing because we can produce renewable energy, but because of the great uh, shortcomings, we cannot deliver it uh, to the final customers, to the, to the steel industry, to the automotive industry. Uh, you realize that we have to work more in synchronization between renewable energy development and upgrade of our grids, because in the end, if you look with the perspective of 2050, which should be the climate uh, neutrality uh, milestone for European economy, we would need in our grids between three to three and a half times more electricity than we have today. And again, for that also, uh, your industry is absolutely key and uh, uh, fundamental. And uh, uh, to, uh, to address uh, all these uh, issues, what it means is that we need uh, to encourage more the growth of the market for decarbonized products, and we have to make sure that uh, companies can develop viable business models. If uh, uh, the most uh, frequent word I heard during the clean transition dialogue was affordability of the energy, the second most important expression was how to bring the business model into the uh, Green Deal, and this is what we, of course, are uh, looking into very, very intensely. So for that, we should uh, put a, a greater focus on sustainability and resilience criteria for these products. Among other things, uh, this is the precondition for ensuring that Europe remains a globally competitive producer of uh, steel, aluminium, uh, cement, and all these other important um, uh, products. And I want to say that uh, we also have to address the way how we look at uh, public procurement, how we look uh, at rewarding the companies which manufacture with low carbon footprint, with great sustainability, 
with decent treatments of their workers. They should be rewarded uh, for their work, for their products, are not punished uh, by the results of public procurement, which always goes for the cheapest alternative coming from somewhere very, very uh, far. Uh, and therefore, uh, we've been looking into this, and I think that uh, first time we introduced uh, uh, this new uh, competitive sustainability criteria in our battery regulation. We use them uh, when we've been uh, addressing the situation in the wind uh, uh, energy sector, and I'm sure that uh, uh, that's the way to go also for other products. In our meetings, which we had a couple of days ago, we discussed uh, at length also how the carbon border adjustment mechanism should work, how it should help the European steel companies in this uh, very difficult uh, context by creating more level playing field uh, with imports. As you know, the CBAM is uh, now in transitional phase and uh, we will push ahead uh, with work to bring it into full operation. Again, what was quite obvious uh, um, uh, in our discussions, uh, there, are, there is a general support for CBAM, but there is also a lot of uh, detailed information which we provided with uh, where uh, the uh, steel manufacturers see a potential for different loopholes, shortcomings, and simply lowering of the efficiency and effectiveness of this, of this measure and uh, uh, therefore there I promise that we will work very closely uh, with the industry and I already discussed it with the Director General of DG Taksud who is looking forward to the detailed exchange in this uh, regard because we want uh, to get uh, uh, this one right and I still know that uh, there is an uh, issue um, if it comes uh, to, the, to the global exports. So if it comes to the third most uh, frequently used expression in our clean transition dialogue was a uh, uh, global level playing field. So these are, I would say, the energy prices, global level playing field, resilience uh, of our industry. This was coming like, I would say, the, uh, the, the reference point in all the, all the meetings uh, uh, we had. Despite of all that, ladies and gentlemen, I totally share uh, the, the, uh, the view uh, of uh, the president uh, uh, of the Eurofair, of uh, Henrik, uh, uh, that the Europe industry has a bright future. This morning I, I heard a very powerful argument, because if you look at what is happening in Europe and elsewhere in the world, where else do you have real green transition taking place? Where else? It's happening really only in Europe. Okay, I mean we we pay a certain price, we are these uh, first movers, we go through uh, these first stages, but indeed the demand uh, for the green uh, premium products, the demand for a low carbon steel, demand uh, for, for clean uh, technology is, uh, uh, is uh, growing rapidly in Europe. And I believe that uh, Europe's uh, future will be built in clean tech, green tech, uh, in uh, providing adequate skills uh, to our workforce and really to preparing the European economy uh, what would be this uh, next stage, uh, uh, I, I believe, uh, in the development of the, of the world economy. I even heard the impression that it's so hard because uh, we went through this very difficult geopolitical situation, but also to a great extent this is the innovation shock through which the whole European economy is going through. But I'm absolutely convinced, because we are very good at this, Europeans, that we will make it, that Europe's industry uh, will have a bright future. You could hear it from every uh, head of state or government, from every president, from uh, every prime minister, that we are ready to fight for European industry, that we want you not only to stay, but to, uh, to prosper, to thrive, and to create high quality jobs here in Europe. And uh, this is, I believe, uh, the strong commitment which you hear from all our leaders. You have seen that over the last year we put a lot of new things on the table uh, under the umbrella of the European Green Deal. Upstream, we've been working uh, very hard on the Critical Raw Materials Act uh, because we know how crucial it is and we cannot repeat the same uh, mistake and pay so much for being dependent as we've been dependent on Russian fossil supplies. We do not want uh, to develop the same dependency on other major supplier of the critical raw materials. Downstream, we listen very carefully to industrial representatives and in a net zero industry act, uh, 
uh, we will be uh, working very hard to make sure that the uh, green and clean tech projects will benefit from reduced administrative burden, from faster permitting procedures, and we are also working hard to provide you with better advice uh, to which support mechanisms apply. And uh, I would say that uh, um, uh, the last point, which I'm sure will be elaborated more by Kurt, uh, if you look at the EU emission trading system with its strong carbon price setting, it clearly provides a clear signal for commitment to decarbonize and we achieve excellent results uh, through this mechanism. But what we need to make sure, and this is what is now uh, clearly uh, enshrined uh, uh, in our legislation, that we want to make sure that all the benefits uh, from the ETS system should be used for decarbonization efforts, for green transition, not, and not as I understand, sometimes very useful tool for the finance ministers to balance the book of the of the state of the state uh, budget. So, what I want to say is uh, to conclude uh, that we very much value uh, exchanges with you, your input, uh, your your suggestions, because we believe that. Uh, uh, with the strengthening uh, of our domestic industrial base, uh, we are also boosting our strategic autonomy, and we know that in uh, these difficult times we definitely uh, need that. Last, last point I would make, uh, just to make uh, sure that uh, you believe me, that we listen to you. Last month at our Steel Dialogue, the Eurofan sent a clear message that urgent action is needed to preserve EU steel production and the quality job. And I would like to underline that uh, we hear you loud and clear, and the Commission stand ready to help you to support uh, EU industry. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I will stand here a second. I can see that lots of people are standing up. There are actually seats a bit near the front. Um, they do say reserved, but since I don't see anyone sitting on them, please feel free to actually sit down um, and sit on some of those seats. Um, thank you so much, um, Executive Vice, Pre Vice President. Um, okay, I'll come here now. Oh, okay, so as you can see, our lovely panellists um, are assembled here. Um, we're not going to allow them the opportunity to have opening statements. We apologise for that, but as you can see, we've got a lot of panellists. There's a lot to talk about. This is a very important topic. So let me now introduce you quickly to all of them. But first things first, everyone, we, I'm not sure if there is a QR code you can scan, but we do have something called Slido where you can all put in questions if you're all feeling a little bit shy. If you're feeling a little bit more adventurous, there is a hand mic and it will be passed around the room. So after the debate with the panellists, who are loading up on their water to get ready to talk to me, um, you can all ask your questions. So don't feel shy. There's so many of you in this room. This is a great topic. There's lots to talk about. So yes, please do put your questions in. I can see some of them already coming already. OK, so joining me for this debate, we have Romanian MEP Christian Silvibusoy. We spoke just a week ago on the health, uh, on, on, on European health, so good to talk to you again. He is also the chair of Parliament's ITRA committee, the industry committee, so it's great to have you here. Thank and you also, so much. My pleasure. And also I understand that you are going into national politics as well, so you can wear the double hat of member state looking at the European side as well. Fantastic. Uh, next we have Kurt Vandenberg, the director general at DG Klima at the European Commission. Welcome. You're not sitting in your order, so this is going to be a little bit tricky for me. <laughs> I won't eject you. You can stay where you are, though. Um, next, we have Timothy Di Maolo, a CEO of, of Aparam, a producer of stainless steel, electrical, and speciality steel. He has said I can call him Tim, because it is stumbling a little bit on your um, name. And he's also the vice president of Eurofa. So welcome. Good to have you um, on the panel. We have Sigrid de Vries, director general of the European Automobile Manufacturers Association. Now, EV Cars... If everyone's been looking at their newsletters this morning from various media organisations, EV cars, there's, there's, there's a lot going on there. So we're going to be coming to you a lot on that. Um, and also maybe to Kurt. Um, next, we have Wadia Fugard. She's the Director General, Head of Policy Positioning and Public Funding at Vestas Wind Systems. Welcome to you too. Finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Peter Tom Jones. What a great name. <laughs> He's the director at KU Leuven Institute for Sustainable Metals and Minerals, and he's also produced an amazing documentary, which we were watching. I know that you've been speaking to your active about that one as well. So just to say to the panelists, um, 
we are going to skip those introductions, so do sort of self-intro yourself um, when I come to questions. First things first, um, MEP Busoy, what did you make of the keynote speeches? What really stood out for you? I, I really believe that now is the momentum to discuss a little bit more serious about uh, industry in Europe. Uh, as uh, we faced many challenges, uh, we had uh, uh, the challenges of pandemics uh, with the disruption of the uh, uh, distribution chains, of uh, uh, the procurement of the necessary uh, raw materials, uh, then of course the crisis of high uh, prices in electricity, the effects of the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, and also the effects on industry of uh, our effort to decarbonize, our very ambitious agenda which uh, should remain as a uh, uh, clear uh, direction for the future with the uh, already binding legal targets for 2030. We'll discuss a little bit, um, I'm sure, in the future about uh, 2040 targets, but we have the Green Deal, the decarbonization target in 2050. Uh, I really think that we need an industrial deal that complement the Green Deal. This is something that the industry also is asking. Uh, more focus on our competitiveness, uh, uh, more pragmatic solutions, maybe readjust uh, some of the intermediary targets, uh, give uh, more concrete support to some of our industries, like uh, the steel industry, because they are committed to decarbonize, they already invested a lot, uh, they have uh, the technological solutions, but still they need to be supported, otherwise it will be extremely difficult, extremely costly, and uh, we have, we'll see the risk to see our industries uh, reducing the production uh, or going abroad, uh, exporting the emissions actually, without really helping our flight uh, or fight, sorry, against uh, climate change. So more pragmatism in the future. The political scan the landscape will uh, change after the elections. I'm sure. Um, already, I see in my political party EPP a little bit more focus on industry, it was always, but now uh, we understand a little bit better the challenges and the need to refocus a little bit our uh, attention. And uh, without uh, losing uh, our enthusiasm uh, for decarbonization, I really think that we uh, need to uh, refocus on industry. Okay. Given that we are in an election cycle, how would you, if you were to give an evaluation or a scorecard, how would you say that Europe has done so far in the last legislature? For industry? Or? Yes, for industry. <laughs> <laughs> On industry, yeah. Um, not so great. Not so not great. Not so great. Uh, more burdens than incentives. Uh, a lot of legal requirements, uh, which of course it helps, otherwise it will be difficult to, to, to incentivize the transformation. Uh, but only after the uh, United States passed the uh, IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, only after assessing uh, what uh, China is doing in order to support even the green technologies, even the transformation, because it's uh, mainly about this. Uh, uh, we started to look a little bit uh, closer to the real needs of the industry. So hopefully in the next term uh, we'll do better. Okay, so Kurt then coming to you, um, just linking up the idea of too much burden then. Um, ambition versus reality and actually delivering on the goals. We of course have this marquee legislation, the Green Deal, but what is the value really of a marquee legislation when there are such things, you know, bad things are going on, high electricity costs, lack of infrastructure, little green hydrogen available at industrial scale. Is the EU really in the position to really now go forward and increase all of its climate ambitions and look beyond 2040 when it's not getting, you could say, some basics right at the moment? Sure, happy uh, to answer that question. Um, first, I should say that Europe is on track with our goals. Uh, we are reducing emissions. Um, we have published last week the latest figures from the ETS. We can now say that since 2005, in the sectors covered by ETS, we have reduced emissions by 47%. And ETS has produced revenues of more than 175 billion euros over 10 years, 
that go back to member states. And hence the importance of what Mr. Sefcovic said, that these resources should be used to support industrial decarbonisation. At the same time, when I look at the figures, I see that unemployment is at a historical low, or trade surplus is at a historical high. In January this year, uh, Eurostat reported that we have had the highest trade surplus since 2002. Um, so it means that we are on track, but it doesn't mean that we should be complacent. Um, one thing I want to say about 2040, 2040 is not about climate ambition. The climate ambition, as Mr. Bouchard has said, has been agreed in the European climate law. Climate neutral by 2050, that's agreed. What we now are discussing is how we move from 2030 in the most cost-efficient manner to 2050. Knowing that for 2030 we have the framework in place, we don't need to add, maybe we need to adjust here and there and do what I would call regulatory hygiene if we see that there are inconsistencies in the regulation. But implementing 2030 is really an investment agenda. And may I say that this is really what Europe needs, regardless of the climate agenda. Even if there was no climate agenda, no decarbonisation need, we would need to invest. Because do you know that China is investing the double of Europe as part of, as a share of GDP? Mm -hmm. So we have to modernise our economy. And that is what the climate agenda, the Green Deal agenda, is offering. Now, I agree, when we launched the Green Deal in 2019, we were surfing on a wave of popular support. The whole public wanted more climate action, but we were alone in the world. No one was following us. Now, five years later, we see that US and China may overtake us in what we thought was our competitive advantage. And I agree with Mr. Bouchoy. The IRA has been a wake-up call for us. Without the IRA, we would not have had all this necessary attention for competitiveness and a real industrial strategy. And from a climate perspective, we are all the ones that are saying the, most, saying the most loudly that we need an industrial deal to succeed with our green transition. That's actually what we have said in the 2040 communication. Um, that is what will um, come through in the communication that the Commission will adopt tomorrow and which I think the leaders next week will adopt as council conclusions. And so we can go into more details what exactly this means, but I fully agree we need a true industrial strategy to succeed because decarbonisation is an opportunity and a necessity. It is not a threat. Without decarbonisation, without an ambitious climate agenda, there will not be an industrial strategy. You know, President Biden says when he thinks of climate, he thinks of jobs, jobs, jobs. When we think of climate, we should also think of industry, industry, industry. Well said. Um, now, you brought up industrial strategy, and there is one man whose name keeps getting brought up, Mario Draghi. Why was he the person chosen to come up with an industrial policy and come up with this policy paper for Europe? Why him? Oh, that you have to ask my former boss, President von der Leyen. I cannot answer this uh, for him. What I do know, you know, I worked for three years for President von der Leyen as her uh, European Green Deal and Health Advisor. Um, and I have seen an, an growing trust uh, between Mrs. von der Leyen and Mario Draghi, who is a very outspoken man. He is his own mind. Uh, he has proven that he can... Uh, do things right uh, in Europe. He's a convinced European and he's also one that is very, very um, concerned um, and interested in Europe's competitiveness. So I assume that Mrs. van der Leyen has full trust uh, in Mr. Draghi and his own thinking, but also knowing that Mr. Draghi has um, the authority and the trust and credibility of Europe's <laughs> leaders. So that's why I think Mr. Draghi's report will be quite influential and impactful. And I can assure you from the European Commission, including from DG Klima, we are feeding Mr. Draghi as much as possible with what he needs to come with a, an impactful report. 
Well, let's hope so. Um, he didn't particularly have the support of his own coalition government when he was Prime Minister, but that's another story. Um, OK, so, Tim, then, you heard what Kurt was saying about modernising the economy, that the EU is on track. He also brought up ETS. How will the Green Deal and the Fit55 package impact your company? Is there any inconsistency or risks there for the European steel sector? And are you, do you have worries and concerns? So thanks for the question, because <coughs> indeed, um, let's say, uh, we fully endorse uh, all this, this measure and uh, the direction of the Commission. I'm uh, even uh, very happy to see uh, the people of the Commission uh, speaking in the right way. And everything is good. But everything is good? No. <laughs> the industry is suffering. The steel industry and the stainless steel industry are suffering. Why this? Because between, between the direction, between the intention, between what we say uh, level play field in everything, there is uh, the way to implement. And in the way to implement and the speed to implement, there are gaps. There are big gaps. And these big gaps are so big uh, uh, that are, uh, let's say, uh, showing a completely different uh, speed and force between actors. I, I used uh, a metaphor in, uh, in a conference saying that we are playing uh, European football against people which are doing American football. And this is com a completely different game. It's a completely game, a different game. United States have done IRA, okay, but not only. They, whenever they, uh, they have been uh, started to be floated by industry which have created excess no market capacity, they immediately acted with 232. Immediately. They didn't care about what was the WTO, what was, they didn't care. They wanted an industry which was a uh, healthy industry and they wanted to protect the industry. They have done it. We have not. We have struggled for many years before having middle measures. And even the measures that we have had, even the good ones, okay, somebody has, uh, has found a way to go around with circumvention, with, uh, with other way to, uh, um, uh, to go through. We have uh, said and it is very clear that we need some strategic uh, initiative for the autonomy, for the uh, resilience of the industry, and then the circular economy is one of the pillars. And so, for example, uh, we have put nickel in the strategic raw material. Yes, but the measure is a, a very small measure. It is only the nickel into the battery, while there is 40 times more nickel, which is in the stainless steel, which is used for everything. So in, in the battery, only 7,000 tons of nickel in the stainless steel, 300,000. But this, this scrap is not put as a, a strategic raw material, a critical raw material, which means that in reality, the measure is one fourth in efficiency of what should be. Also in the public procurement, how can be credible to all of us that uh, the industry need to propose and invest and do a lot of effort to be the greenest in the world? We are proud of it. But then even in the public procurement, there is not an efficient uh, indication or an efficient obligation to, to buy this very good material which we are proud of. Uh, so it is, uh, th there are a lot of inconsistency between what is the direction which we fully endorse and what is the, the, the need of the industry to be supported in. While we found, we found in our competitors a very clear strategy. The American has been said, but also China is very structured. They have a policy, they have an industrial policy. They look at what they have to do and they go. And they are able to support the industry and create, create jobs and support their, their jobs. 
So when you compare China to the EU, what would you like the EU to be doing for you? Sorry? When you compare China and the EU, their approaches, what would you like the EU to be doing better for you as a company or as First a is speed. Mm -hmm. when, when you have to assess a problem, you cannot take one, two, three, four years. The industry today is at a rhythm of quarter. Every quarter can change. We are a cyclical industry in which cycle lasts two, two years maximum and goes ups and down, ups and down, and we, need, and we need to adjust at the speed which is in months, not in years. Uh, and second, uh, an holistic approach. So you cannot say only, I, I look only at the CO2, or only at this, or in this. The Green Deal has to be with an industrial deal. You have a, a fantastic Green Deal without industry, is perfect, but we will be, uh, I don't know, tourist guides, uh, restaurants, uh, museum, uh, all this. This is perfect. This is the perfect Green Deal. Okay? Would you like to comment? No, I just wanted to mention that... Uh, he also stole your football analogy because he was coming with one as well, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of the fundamental choices we are facing with Europe. Do we want to become an industrial museum or not? And I think we are on the right track to becoming one. But I'll speak about that later. Okay. I didn't want to barge in and stop you from speaking. I'm no, sorry. No, no, it's, okay. <laughs> it's, it's no problem at all. And I noticed that we have actually lots of questions um, on slide already. Just to get a gauge from the audience, who here would actually like to ask an in-person question as well? I could see a show of hands. Okay, one at least. Okay, so what I'm, yeah, okay. So I think, I think people who are watching either, you know, they're joining us here in person and then obviously the guys online, I think they do also have a lot of questions for all of you. So I will allow you all to speak. And then we'll go to the questions. Um, OK, so Sigrid then, as we were discussing before um, we came and sat here, there's been a lot of noise um, today we've seen um, on EV cars. Um, but first of all, let's, let's talk about the actual value chain then. Um, and I want to come specifically about, talk to you specifically about um, you know, what's going on with supply chains. So a um, few things, 2035, the EU is going to ban the sale of petrol and diesel cars. So just like the steel industry, um, you're going to need to adapt and transition to um, cleaner technology. We've had, or we are currently, um, enduring um, an Israel-Gaza war that has, of course, spilled beyond the borders now. Um, it's affecting global trade, which is declining. Um, we're having ships detouring. Uh, from the Red Sea to avoid these Houthi rebels that are attacking ships. They've been attacking them since November, and those attacks have been carrying on um, into, I think, the last week. Um, so China, I believe, is responsible for about 60% of all new EV registrations worldwide. EV sales to Europe are also impacted because of these attacks in the Red Sea, um, because shippers are taking, having to take more expensive and longer routes now to try to get uh, to where they need to get to. Um, so. If you cannot solely depend on China's critical raw materials to build batteries in the EU uh, for electric cars, how can the EU mitigate the risk and support um, the industry's transition? That's a lot to take in. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so m maybe just first to reassure everyone that indeed the 2035 target is about new vehicles, mm. right? Uh, passenger cars and, and, and vans. So you can still drive your vehicles hopefully also on renewable fuels by then, but it's not. Uh, that dramatic. It's dramatic enough. Um, China, indeed 60% registration today of electric vehicles, that is predominantly also because China is the biggest market for vehicles, you know, lots of people living there, so a very large market. Um, we are in Europe at the moment at around 15% of battery electric vehicle market share, uh, coming from, you know, single digit uh, percentages only very recently, so you see a rapid rise, but indeed we need to go to 100% in 2035, which will be a huge challenge. And I'd like to stay with the um, metaphor of, of team sport, maybe not football, but we need, it's a team sport that we need, it's a team play that we need, because this is a seismic shift, not just from one powertrain technology to another, but really needing the charging infrastructure, we need the market to play ball because currently people are still very concerned about whether they can charge, uh, about affor affordability, um, man many things that are, are depressing the market somewhat. 
And uh, when looking at this from an industrial point of view, indeed we need to be able to uh, profitably and also affordably manufacture vehicles in Europe. So this is not just an issue of uh, our members, I say our members, the 15 car, trucks, bus manufacturers being competitive. That's in their DNA. They've been competing with Japanese, with Korean manufacturers for long. They will compete. They are competing with Chinese. It's really, and this is what the wake-up call I think is about, about Europe's competitiveness. Because there we then talk about having a, a solid, thriving, healthy manufacturing industry here with lots of jobs connected to it and a great future attached to it because it's a very innovative industry with a lot of trickle-down effect on other sectors. So indeed, we need to be more independent from China but this will not happen overnight. Currently, 75% of the value chain for batteries is dominated by China, and I think uh, Mr. Jones can tell us mu much more about that. He did a great movie about this. So that will take time. Uh, so we need, decoupling is an illusion, but we need to become more resilient. We need to become more sovereign, more independent, but it will take time. Lots of great initiatives taken at EU level, but we don't have a lot of time and it really needs a team sport, all hands on deck to, to get there. We need the cheaper energy um, as well because that's a clear factor in competing with other sectors, other world regions um, as well. And um, the regulatory framework is incredibly important. It was said a couple of times, we have the Green Deal, that's a lot of regulation on paper. We now need to make that transition to actually uh, executing all of this in practice in reality and this is where the friction starts because it's not synchronized lots of things happening indeed when 2019 the green deal was announced we did not have two wars on our doorstep the commissioner also mentioned it we did not have uh, spiraling prices or these geopolitical tensions that we see so we need to be able to adjust we need to implement uh, and we need to really work together with many uh, different parties around the table to to make this happen because the direction of travel is very very clear but the how is going to be very hard very difficult uh, and we just need to make sure that we succeed well there's definitely one team that's getting behind you and that does seem to be uh, the european commission um so just to talk a little bit about what been you know seeing you know in the news today eu competition commissioner uh, vestager She's in the US uh, and she's allegedly meant to be talking about tougher restrictions on Chinese EVs, wind turbines, um, microchips, and what she believes that, you know, a decade ago the EU failed to get their strategy right and restrict Chinese products. So maybe now um, they will take a harder um, action against China. Also, the Internal Market Commission, Thierry Breton, open to opening up anti-dumping investigations into EV cars. So is all of this the kind of things that you need, especially the European Commission, to be doing? Look, you have a regulation on the one side, and you have trade defence measures on the other far end. But what we really need to focus on, and I've been talking about that, is really that part in the middle, which is establishing a robust business case. That's far more important, and that is what I believe the wake-up call should be about. Uh, not now looking at trade defence instruments. They, I mean, if there uh, is distortion, if rules have been broken, and of course the Commission needs to investigate and we need to look at that very seriously, but this is not a long-term solution. It can never be. I think the Commission will be the first also to acknowledge that. So let's really focus on the fundamental issues. It's about competitiveness of Europe that's at stake here, and uh, there we need to step up efforts together. Right, reply? No. I agree uh, yeah. entirely with Sigrid. I think uh, trade is good. Trade is necessary, especially for a continent like Europe that is so dependent on trade. Yeah? We don't have critical raw materials or much uh, needed from the rest of the world. So we need to preserve trade, but it has to be fair. Competition is good as long as it is fair. And I think what you're seeing with the announcement today by uh, Mrs. Vestager and the Commission on opening a new uh, investigation on Chinese subsidies for windmills shows that we are getting much more serious about the global level playing field and taking care of Europe's interests. This has already started with the carbon border adjustment mechanism where we're clearly signaling to the rest of the world our market will always be open but only for clean products. We don't want to buy dirty products anymore. Uh, we do the same with the deforestation regulation. The president has announced an investigation on subsidies for uh, Chinese electric vehicles. We know the windmills. Trade is good, 
but it has to be fair and we have to use the trade defense instrument portfolio that we have grown now over the last two years. We need to use this to the best possible effect. Okay, well let me come to Wadi then and also in point, I can see that the questions are building and building on Slido. Um, so Wadi then, I mean, obviously you work in the wind energy sector and that possibly has you could say the fewest bad effects um, on the environment, but we do have now this impetus for greater sustainability and value chain resilience. Uh, there has been increase in commercial partnerships between European wind producers and other European producers of materials and components. So this, I would presume, is a very positive change for your sector, but are there also any challenges? Uh, plenty, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I think if I can come in a little bit on the comments made by the two uh, peers here, because I completely agree on, on what you're saying, on, on what is missing, right? It's, it's this fundamental um, policy that unlocks our industry to scale sustainably. And I think that's what you were getting at. Um, for us in the wind industry, we have seen the fantastic wind power package at the end of uh, last year, which has been um, extremely helpful and needed. Um, but then on the other side of that is, where is the implementation across the member states? And, and that is, and, and you're smiling and nodding because you know, it is the next step and that is what is needed. So something like permitting, for example, the wind power package is very clear on what member states should do. Some member states are championing it and doing great, Others need a bit more action. Things like offshore auction systems with their race to the bottom type mechanisms. Some member states are not running these systems, which is great. Some member states are. So there is a lot, uh, um, ArcelorMittal on um, offering low emission steel. So there are some steps we can take to further our growth. Um, but we need to look at the sustainability of our sector, a sector and how do we drive that long term. I think that's where the action should come in. Okay, so over then to Dr. Peter, or was it Dr. Tom, you prefer to be Dr. Tom is Tom. fine. Tom is fine, Tom is okay, fine, great. Yes. So I mean, talk to us then about this documentary game and, and, and the documentary that you've made and the findings that have come out of that then. I mean, you've, you've heard from all the panelists, what do you make of everything that they said? <laughs> I would like to use some metaphor, not from football this time, but from, from film. I, I want to go back to my favorite film, which is Life of Brian, Monty Python, if the people remember this one. And there is this famous scene in there where the People's Judean Front is having another meeting to discuss their strategy to fight the Romans. Sorry, sorry about the Italians here. So they're going to fight the Romans, but they keep having meetings and events and resolutions and documents. And someone says, no, we should have action now. We've spoken enough, we've had enough meetings, so let's have action. And they all agree, and the final conclusion was, okay, let's have another meeting about it. I think that's sort of, I'm sorry about that, good to use that, but for me, it, it epitomizes the situation of Europe, in particular, when we're talking about critical raw materials. Uh, I've been working in this field now since the rare earth crisis, which was 2010. We had uh, several critical metals lists published by the European Commission since then. I think we have the fifth one out recently. And what has actually fundamentally changed in those 13, 14 years? Nothing. We still have no rare earth mine. We still have no lithium mine. We still have no lithium refinery. It still takes 15.6 years to open a new mine in Europe. The Chinese do this in less than a year. The Chinese build a lithium refinery faster than we can build a house. So if you want to use metaphors, we're doing a race where the Chinese are driving a Ferrari, an uh, electric one, and, and, and we, are using, <laughs> we are using, I'm not going to name any negative brands here, but we're using a very old car with this bad internal combustion engine, very slow, no acceleration. How can we compete? I think that's really, for me, the, the metaphor of our situation today. And I think in, especially if you go to the general public, they have no clue of what is happening at the moment. They have no clue that Europe is at risk of becoming an industrial museum. Uh, and make no mistake about it, I am from the Green Party originally. I am greener than anyone here in this audience. Uh, I have been, I have been uh, fighting for climate change since donkey's years, and I still am. 
But I think we have to stop being naive because we are extremely naive. When I look at the, the Critical Raw Materials Act, the, the big question now is, okay, we have this beautiful document. It was very fast in, in producing it. We did it in, in less than, than a year, actually. So that's a world record for Europe. But now we have to implement it. And when I speak to people from companies, I already see that they are really worried that their strategic projects that they now have to announce to the European Commission, that once they have to go back to their member states, that they will be facing the same problem because the legislation is full of silos. So we might have the silo of the CRMA, which wants to open critical raw material mines. For example, the Pergeier, let's use that one. I think that's a brilliant example for this meeting room here because it combines steel, iron ore, with my favorite passion, rare earths. It's a mine that combines iron ore enriched with rare earths in appetite. So that particular mine could really solve the whole of European rare earth dependency problem just by opening that and additionally, well, actually it's the main driver, of course, you get loads of cheap, good quality iron ore. But if you speak to Jan Mustrum about how many years do you think it's going to take to open this mine, he's like, yeah, 2035 maybe? Is that really the best we can do? It's not going to work like that. We, we really have to be faster. We have to be more agile. The Chinese are so agile. And I think we really need to develop a European answer to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative model, an answer towards the American Inflation Reduction Act. And frankly speaking, I don't think we have found it at this moment. And now my real worry is that with the next European elections, that it will become even more difficult because all focus will be lost. We'll be focusing more on migration issues, on military issues, and I'll probably even forget about climate change. So I'm really worried about what is going to happen after the next European elections. I'm really worried about the implementation of the Critical Raw Materials Act because on paper it's great. That document is really a masterpiece of, of text. If you would really implement what is written there, we could really solve Europe's problem. I think. We're speaking here about the steel industry, uh, we're speaking, speaking about the wind turbine industry, the car industry, so that's all wonderful. But we need the materials. Yeah. Uh, we need critical raw materials for making steel. We need critical raw materials like rare earth for producing your generators of your direct drive wind turbines. We need the stainless steel scrap. We need that to stay in Europe. Mm -hmm. And now it's, it's going outside of our borders because we can't even keep it in Europe, full of nickel. And we're just throwing it away, basically. So there's a lot of possibilities there, but without a change in mindsets, without a change in attitude, I think we'll, we'll still be in a business as usual scenario. And that's my worry. I get invited to a lot of these uh, events, uh, Euro Mines, Euro Meto, Euro Fair. <laughs> and I seem to repeat myself every time. Uh, probably, probably you too, as well. <laughs> The good thing is we have Sefcovic, who, who speaks a bit like Jurgen Klopp, who is the manager of my favorite football team, and he has a will-do mentality. And that's what we also really need in our next uh, European Commission, our next European Parliament. We're going to need that kind of figures who want to really change things and not just keep talking, because then, then we are definitely lost forever. Well, I would count you with one thing, that there's only one Jurgen Klopp. No one else can be Jürgen Klopp. Yeah, but, he's, um, he's stopping here, actually, so yeah. maybe, maybe he's, uh, he's, he's ready for a new career. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that one's definitely for the football fans. Apologies if you're not. Um, so, I MEP mean, Shoy, then, you heard what, 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 what Peter was saying then. Do you think everything, the momentum, the good momentum of this legislation will be lost in the next um, parliamentary cycle, especially if we start talking about um, you know, all the different factions that could be joining up, especially at the European Parliament, the populists? It is difficult to predict what uh, the changes uh, will be, because uh, for the moment we don't have the complete picture. Uh, what I see now at the end of this legislator, uh, and it's not only the committee that I'm chairing, ITRE committee, I'm seeing also a little bit of change of tone in the European Commission. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we just heard uh, Mr. Shevkovich, who was in ITRE committee, committee this morning, speaking a little bit about future Thierry Breton, a champion of uh, European industry, not only in the space or defense, but uh, 
one of the first speaking about uh, industrial deal uh, was also uh, this morning talking a lot about uh, how we finance everything that we proposed already and what we need to propose in the future and uh, the state aid schemes, how much we can uh, rely on this uh, and we need to, to, to be aware that uh, via that we can uh, uh, implement uh, some of our ambitions because everything a lot is about investment. So already at the end of this term I see a little bit of reorientation of uh, the current establishment. Also in my political party in EPP uh, looking at the tone of President von der Leyen, uh, of President Weber and other colleagues uh, uh, they acknowledge the fact that we need to, without once again uh, uh, losing the enthusiasm for the Green Deal, implementing correctly what we decided, to be more pragmatic, less naive, because true, we are a little bit naive in some areas, and more focused uh, on our competitivity, on our jobs. Uh, at this moment, the prediction is that we'll still have a pro-European majority, a little bit uh, uh, a little bit uh, reduced as number, but uh, at least the three parties uh, can have uh, together a majority with the increase of uh, of the Eurosceptics, let's say like this, but you know that there are different parties with different approaches, so they are in different categories. Uh, increase of, of uh, this uh, and uh, reduce of uh, the Greens uh, uh, parties uh, proportion in European Parliament. Uh, in many of the uh, uh, industrial files and energy files, uh, we uh, had a good cooperation with the colleagues from uh, uh, ECR mainly, but not only from ECR. Some of these parties are already governing parties. Uh, uh, you know well uh, the discussions about Italy. I'm quite happy about uh, the, the, the fact that uh, Prime Minister Meloni remained with the pro-European agenda and we don't have complaint about this. Uh, so I think we'll have a little bit uh, less uh, over enthusiasm on uh, environmental policies and more uh, enthusiasm uh, on uh, strengthening our economies. Uh, and uh, at least this is what I hope. Then, of course, let's see the result. Let's see the behavior of uh, uh, those parties who will increase their uh, numbers. Uh, but uh, with uh, uh, the right proposal from the next uh, European Commission and with uh, uh, still a pro-European majority in European Parliament, with a little bit of more pragmatism of the current political uh, uh, pro-European forces, EPP, SND, and Renew, we can be optimistic. Well, the APP is obviously a very big uh, pro-European force, but there was something that, you know, all of us at Euractive um, wanted to ask you about as well. Um, back in February, uh, we reported on a leaked EPP election manifesto that appeared to want to revise the combustion engine phase-out. Was that a manifesto typo? You know the discussion about the 2035 target, you know well uh, the concerns of the industry, uh, also uh, the request of some national governments, uh, and of course uh, Germany is the most important country in the European Union, the, most, the biggest contributor to, to the European uh, budget, uh, the country that is uh, represent with the highest number of MEPs in the European Parliament, and the CDU CSU will send maybe the most numerous team in the next European Parliament. At least this is what the polls are, uh, are showing. Uh, about uh, revising legislation, uh, let's see. But there is a concern that uh, maybe on some of the targets uh, we are a little bit uh, unrealistic. Uh, in the same time, we know that the direction is uh, for electric car, for cars, for electrification, for decarbonization in all the sectors. What is important is to find the right balance. Okay. Yeah, I would love to comment on that because I find it absolutely mind-boggling that and in Europe at this point of time we can question the transition to electric mobility. If we now in the, the car industry in Europe would decide to hold back this transition, then we are definitely lost and the whole European car industry will be dead 
If we don't see that, then what else are we talking about? I just can't get my head around it. people thinking that it would make sense to try to prolong the lifetime of the internal combustion engine vehicle while we are already being overtaken by the Chinese electric vehicles. The tsunami is coming. It's, 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 it's not, not only coming, it's there. It has arrived in Holland. The first BYD transporter ships have arrived with 7,000 uh, BYDs being spewed out every time. If we now turn back the clock and try to think we can go back to the ICE car, then we're definitely lost. So this should be a cross-party point of view. If you're left wing or right wing, it does not matter. There is only one future for the car industry that is a made in Europe EV industry. Mm -hmm. And that should be a, a point that we all agree upon. Because I don't think the, the deindustrialization should be taken very lightly. I think we, we really have to go for a reindustrialization of Europe, but it has to be a clean tech based one. That's the only option we have. And that's where we can be friends because then the climate agenda and the clean tech industry agenda will be the same agenda. But if we are now going to come back and try to go to the internal combustion engine vehicle, then we're shooting ourselves in the foot. It's a suicidal strategy. So I can't get my head around how any politician at this moment can think in that way. Really crazy for me. OK, I think Sigurd first and then, yeah. No, I, th I think, you know, there, there is no turning back. And that, I think, is not the discussion, and it shouldn't be. But I do think, and I, I said before, there is going now from a paper reality to an actual reality. And there you see the fiction starts, and there are real concerns out there. And today, the tra trajectory doesn't look great. So in the law, there is the target for 2035. In the law is also a review clause for good reasons, because we need to keep very close track of are we going to get there in the right way, what is needed, and exactly for the reasons that also Mr. Jones was mentioning, that we don't want to deindustrialize, because we want to have a healthy, thriving manufacturing industry in Europe, including a car industry, and the uh, technology of the future will be predominantly electric. Not for all types of vehicles and not in all corners of Europe, but predominantly, predominantly electric. I fully agree. And there we have to have the competitive edge. So electromobility should go full, full throttle towards it. But it's not just about this technology change. It's about many, many other, other factors that also need to work together. And I think this is what, what the discussion should be about. If we end up having this dogmatic black and white way, are you in favor? or against a target. This is not, I mean, then we're not getting to the action that um, we had this passionate call for just now. We sh let, let's not get, you know, become lost in that kind of discussion, but yeah. indeed jump into action. That's what I would say. And let me then say, be before I give the wrong impression, industry is playing its role. We have invested 250 billion euro in the electrification of vehicles in Europe, that's more than the GDP of several EU countries combined. So, I mean, we're there, we're doing it, let's get away from this debate that is not leading us anywhere and let's get really into action, that's what I would say. I wanted to very briefly comment to suggest that Euractiv uses uh, Tom's statements as the headline report from this uh, event. Uh, I fully agree with Sigrid. I think we have the target agreed um, and we have a review process to look at all the conditions that are necessary to achieve that target. And rather than using the review to question again everything that we have agreed, we should look at the conditions that need to be in place to achieve it. And that's, in general, I think, what is now at stake for the European Green Deal. Tom was saying, what has changed over the last 10 years? A very good question, Tom. Um, maybe some of you in the room here remember 2005, the Wim Kok report about competitiveness. 2014, 10 years ago, Mr. Juncker launched his uh, Juncker plan for investment. Axel mentioned to me last night the figures of decline in steel production in Europe since more than 10 years, despite all these reports on competitiveness. Huh? Um, what has changed now is that we now see that the pipeline of projects for modernization, for investment, for decarbonization is overflowing compared to 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we had to look for projects 
because the, Mr. Juncker promised money, but there were no projects. Today, the pipeline of projects is overflowing, but we need to find the money to do this investment and make sure that when companies come with decarbonized products, that there is an offtake market uh, for this, that the green premium is paid for. That is really what we need to look at now. And so I agree with those who say we now need to focus on implementation. That is what matters most. Uh, fully agree with that. And implementation is investment. And that investment drive will modernize our economy so that we don't repeat the mistakes of 2005 and 2014. So we have agreed now the Green Deal and the whole framework. Let's make sure it happens because that's crucial for our uh, future competitiveness. Kurt, if I can ask you a question. Do you believe that the Critical Raw Materials Act that has now been officially adopted, uh, in which we need to be able to open a critical raw material mine in 27 months, do you think this is going to happen? Because I see the lawyers, they're having a ball. They're going to have a wonderful time. The lawyers are going to look at the legislation we have from an environmental point of view, and the legislation we have from the critical raw materials point of view, and they're, they're going to collide. So the lawyers are going to have a great time, they're going to earn a lot of money, and I can't see how we will be able to open new mines in 27 months. Or maybe I'm too pessimistic. Well, let me refer to what we did in renewable energy, where there is an issue of permitting. We have come with regulations to speed up uh, the uh, permitting for renewable energy. Last year, Europe added 72 gigawatt additional capacity of renewable energy, wind and solar. Uh, so we can do this, um, but it does require a constant political push from the European level to especially the regional and local levels, um, where there is a lack of capacity in the administrations to really deal with all this permitting that is needed. And that is also applying to mining. I think the Commission has clearly said, if it depends on us, we open mines. We need to do mining again in Europe. We need to do it, of course, in a sustainable and responsible manner. But we can only be preaching to the rest of the world of doing sustainable mining if we do it also in Europe. Um, but we need to get the leaders around the table and make uh, sure that it happens at national level. Okay. Well, listen, look, um, we're going to run over a little bit because we started a bit later. If you do need to leave, just do it quietly. So if everyone's okay with running a bit over, we will, because there's lots of questions. So there's a question from Tom. I hope it wasn't from you. Um, it says, how serious are policymakers, and I presume the Commission, about the true support for competitiveness, given the huge wave of implementing regulations coming into the next term and past promises to focus on making Europe most competitive uh, economy again? Um, perhaps, MP sure you could take that one. Or no? It's for Tom or for...? Um, no, no, no. Uh, the I question was I for, the for question. Tom. It was a very so, long question, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was either for um, MEP Broussoy. Um, I think it, it, it talks about how serious are policymakers about true, true support for competitiveness, given that there's going to be a huge wave of regulations coming in the next term. I think European Commission is uh, more fitted to this because the uh, initiative is uh, okay. the European Commission. Clearly... Uh, I don't see so many regulations coming, uh, uh, at least not comparing with this term. Uh, a lot uh, was done, uh, now we need to implement, we need to finance what we already decided. Of course, we need to fine-tune uh, and we still need to revise some of the older regulations from, from other sectors, but for the uh, industry policy and for the clean technologies, uh, net zero, NZIA, STEP, uh, uh, Fit for 55, uh, for, uh, for everything that uh, we need to follow in the coming years, uh, the big issue will be the implementation one and not necessarily the, the new regulatory. As much as the Parliament is uh, concerned, uh, I believe that uh, we'll try to uh, be as efficient as possible and as uh, uh, focused on industry as possible, at least uh, what will be the ITRA committee in the next term? Okay. May, may yeah. I add yes. something? Because we are talking so much about regulation. And we, uh, we are talking about financing uh, our ambition, etc. But fundamentally, the industry is based on uh, business cases. An industry can transform itself if there is a business case for which this uh, leads to a sustainable profitability. 
And this has a lot of components which are forgotten. One is speed, I, I continuously repeat that speed is uh, mandatory. The second is uh, all the condition of a level play field in everything we do. Uh, the third one is the fact that whenever there, is, uh, there, there are industries which are growing, there should not be a kind of uh, hate of uh, the uh, uh, champions uh, in, in the industry, which, uh, which is the case. All these kind of things, which are the real life, leads to the fact that the industry can transform only having sustainable, a sustainable profitability. If we are losing money, we will not invest. Whatever it subsidy can, can be done, that in reality subsidy are always, uh, let's say, suspicious in, in our conception. When, when Chinese, uh, uh, you were referring to the fact that it, what is the difference between China and, uh, and Europe in, in the car industry? We regulate and they, uh, they, they put subsidies. They don't regulate, they don't have a target, a clear target, etc. They've put a 50 to 80 percent subsidy on, uh, on the batteries. Full stop, the industry will go. And this is the main difference. If we don't understand that uh, this is the difference, that we cannot only with the regulation solve the problem, the industry will not move. Could I also come in yes. with an example on that? And also in the keynote, the phrase viable business models was also used. Um, for example, in the offshore wind industry, uh, we have a big challenge on project realization because business cases there are being squeezed through these race to bottom auctions. It means that we end up having these projects coming to market with very poor business cases, which are causing delays, uh, which are squeezing the industry, and then also the end consumer perhaps having to pay for it as well. So fixing the fundamentals, again, we're back to that word, on how our renewable projects come to market, how the business cases are fostered to ensure a sustainable growth, it's, it's, it's really, much more of an important discussion uh, than some of these regulatory uh, topics. Yep, go ahead, yeah. If I may quickly add on this, um, first I agree with Mr. Bourgeois, um, the next commission should not be about legislation, but about implementation. Mm. Yeah? But we also count on the Parliament to refrain from asking more and more legislation. <laughs> yeah? We are now preparing for the next commission to see how we can make implementation politically attractive. Because simply doing implementation is politically not very attractive. So we are looking for putting together a whole package of what we call investment initiatives mm -hmm. to show that the Green Deal is working and that we create the business cases. Uh, secondly, in terms of regulation, we have done a lot of regulation. Now. We need to implement and we need to do regulatory hygiene where we see inconsistencies, um, overlaps, contradictions. We need to find a way, together with the Parliament, Mr. Bourgeois, to make sure that we can surgically intervene without reopening everything again. In passing, may I say that if you look to the UK, which has left the UK, the EU regulatory machine, they actually miss our regulation a lot because the investments are not happening because of a lack of certainty. The third thing I would like to say is that um, obviously we all are concerned about the business case. That is what we really need to find now. But the business case cannot depend on eternal subsidies because there's simply no public money for this. So what we're now looking for is the right financial instruments to share the risk or de-risk the investment by the private sector. Because what we've done with Fit for 55, we have created the framework for a market for clean products in the future that will be there by law. The market will be there. But we need to make sure that the investment now happens, that we catalyze, mobilize this investment, that investors have the reasonable assurance of return on investment, and so that, for example, the green premium will be paid for. That if you develop a green product, someone will pay for it, will buy it. That is what we now need to do. And I think with the European Investment Bank, which is looking at counter guarantees and all kinds of other measures, 
or innovation fund, uh, which is now doing auctions uh, for green products, uh, subsidizing the production of green products. Um, the Capital Markets Union will be very important in this. We actually now have all the tools and instruments in place. We need to make it work in a good dialogue with industry. Sigrid, so does that sound good to you? Yeah, it, it does. I mean, I think, you know, what we keep feeling a bit is that Indeed, the EU is very much about regulation as compared to China and the US that do it in a different way. And the risk is, and we've seen it with the Green Deal, that the cart is put before the horse. So now coming with a business case and with all the good measures taken, it is of course wonderful, but it would have been better if that would have been the co coherent approach from the outset. And so if there's one lesson learned also going forward, I hope it's that one. But this is such a massive transformation mm -hmm. that we really also need to make sure that we get it right now. So, yeah. Well, some of the um, people that are commenting on Slido do also agree with you when you were talking about Harold, um, who was saying that they 100% support uh, your point on the business case. Um, let's now quickly go to the floor. Yes, a gentleman there, you caught my eye out. Yeah. If you could just take the microphone. Oh, the microphone's coming just from behind you. There you go. Thank you. Pierre Gröning speaking for the German chemical and pharmaceutical industry. Um, when we talk about uh, a risk of deindustrialization, I think we should say it's happening, it's there. I mean, again, just talking for my association, we have lost 20% of production in two years. Um, perspective for this year is not good. Outlook for also the coming years are at best kind of stagnation of, of the market. So I think, I think to a large extent deindustrialization is already happening. Other sectors might be in a better shape, but I think many other sectors are also kind of struggling. Um, so that's just an initial comment. Um, from, from many of the comments I, I got uh, right now, is like there are three models, the Chinese model, European model, American model, kind of the summarizing, simplifying, US model is good, Chinese model is good, European model is, well, less good, let's put it like that. So I, I just wonder how much kind of do we really need to learn from these other kind of constituencies and how much really structural change needs to happen in Europe to really meet the targets. Who would like to answer that? Go for it, yeah. Thanks. yeah. yeah for me, it's a lot about the, the narrative and the storytelling that we bring out. That's also why I like to make documentaries, because we are speaking here for the church of all the people that have already been converted. And basically, you're all business people, mostly, and you're in this field, and you, you understand this very well. but majority population doesn't doesn't understand this and they don't really see this and they will buy a Chinese BYD car if it's a lot cheaper just because it's cheaper and it also looks nice so I think we really need to invest and this is a in America they would say bipartisan cross-party support left-wing right-wing we really need to invest in the made in Europe story and if you ask me what can we learn from China I think we can learn a lot from China not the bad things obviously but there are some good things they have had a strategy, a long-term vision, vertical integration from mine to refinery to battery production, permanent magnet motor production, steel production, final clean tech product, and now they dominate in electrolyzers, heat pumps, EVs, wind turbines, you name it, they've, they've got everything. So I think they have operated in such a way that they looked at the bigger picture and they wanted the bigger picture to be successful and they took losses in single units along the supply chain. That was okay, they subsidized them. As long as the whole supply chain worked, it was fine. And then you look at Europe, and Europe said, okay, let's, let's export our moral, social, environmental responsibility in terms of how to produce the metals that we need for our clean technologies. Let this be done in other places, let them have the responsibilities, the liabilities, the environmental and social issues, we just import the materials cheaply. That model was nice as long as neoliberalism, free trade, globalization worked. But that period is over. We live now in a new era indefinitely. And we have to wake up to that reality. So that means, that for me, it's about, I don't know how you can do it good, but that's your job. How can you, how can you try to think in terms of the whole supply chain where every single part of the unit can be also become made in Europe and that you have agreements between upstream and downstream players that they are willing to take their material from upstream at a higher price and that the next part in the cycle can also then make sure that they can have that cost, the higher cost in the final product and that you then support that through 
public procurement systems, like green public procurement. We have the unbelievable example here in Flanders where we have just destroyed our only bus building company for a large extent because we bought Chinese electric buses because they were cheaper, because we get them faster. But that is just maybe nice in the short run, you get more buses cheaply, but in the long run you're destroying your whole economy, your whole industry. So how can we learn from the Chinese and build this entire supply chain from mine to refinery, magnet producer, battery producer, steel producer, aluminium producer, zinc producer, and then all the different final clean tech products. How can we support that? How can you support that? I think that's for me the main question politically and that, that should be something that we all agree upon. Left wing, right wing, green parties, it doesn't really matter. We're all in this together. Well, so how do we do that? That's my question. Well, hold your thoughts um, because MEP Bourgeois needs to leave. So everyone please round of applause for our MEP. Would you like to say any final thoughts? No. He needs to get to the parliament. Would you like to say anything? Thank you so much, Amy, to, to join a TV debate which is broadcasted from the parliament. Uh, so I cannot be late to the, to the, to the debate uh, <laughs> from there. But uh, I really believe that uh, uh, we need to be optimistic. More and more the policy makers uh, acknowledge the fact that we need to be more pragmatic and give a more concrete support to EU industry and competitiveness. So uh, time will tell us if it's like that, but I'm very confident. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hearing from my year active colleagues. Do we have time for one more question from the floor? OK, so the lady who had a hand up. There you go. So you can be the final question then. Hi everyone, it's Elspeth Hathaway here from Industrial Europe. So trade unions are also in the room, um, Peter. We represent workers all the way from mining right the way through to industry, steel, um, automotive, as you well know. So very concretely, elections are coming up. Um, I do believe that when we talk about climate, we do have to talk about jobs. If you want buy-in, that's absolutely important. So we've talked today, how do we avoid, concretely, what do you say to European workers in industry? How do we avoid decarbonisation leading to deindustrialisation, and how can we ensure a just transition for all industry, industrial workers and regions across Europe? Go for it, yeah. 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 I think it, that's a very important question because I think uh, also the European Commission promised that no one would be left behind and that's if you like the account that is still open now and that should be worked on and I think it's a multifaceted challenge again because it's about a, a risk of deindustrialization which would be fewer jobs which uh, but it's also a, a skills and reskilling and upskilling challenge because we need different kinds of jobs so we need to do a massive transformation there and I think uh, in our industry is very much con convinced that it should be a just transition and that that is part of a properly managed transformation and that we should not just focus on a battery value chain or on uh, subsidizing or kickstarting uh, you know purely green innovation but also making this transformation happen so that indeed all these regions where in my case the automotive industry is so rooted in the economic and societal fabric that you know they are upright and standing and, and also thriving. So I think we're working also with industrial, I think we agree on many things. We have the Automotive Skills Alliance, so industry also again is really playing its role there, but it's an often, I think maybe too often forgotten part of this transformation that should get the proper attention as well. If I can add, <coughs> is that my conviction after so many years in the industry is that European industry is technologically and from the quality of the the labor uh, and so the people which are in industry the best in the world we are by far better than any other region in the world the problem we have is uh, the transformation that we are uh, trying to face in which there is one keyword or uh, concept which is a level play field if we don't have a level play field, we will lose. And the level play field is in everything, is in the way you implement a regulation of the Green Deal should be a level play field. So the same product should be differentiated by a product which is coming with a much cheaper 
uh, price much cheaper cost, which has been subsidized, has created a lot of, uh, of pollution in the world. Uh, and the same is for trade. If there are regulation of trade, should be the same. We cannot play with different game. We are the only one region in the world which is still convinced that WTO is the solution. <laughs> the only one. Exactly. Uh, it's incredible. We are the good ones, but WTO is dead. In a sense, it's dead because the United States are not recognized anymore. China has never recognized anymore. So we are the only one playing with this. If we continue in this way, we will not have the business model which supports our strength. And our strength, I repeat, because I'm really convinced we have the best labor force in the world, the most skilled. We have a lot of experience from the past. In the industry we represent, huh? in, uh, in the industry which are, uh, I am for steel, but the same is, uh, is for car, the same is for many other sectors around. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, the age of neoliberalism is over. So that means also the, re the regime of the WTO is over as we knew it. And we have to wake up to that reality and adapt our, our, our model. If, if I may answer the, the question about ESG-friendly jobs and future-proof jobs, we have them. We have the, the best mines in the world, the safest mines, best paid uh, people in those mines. We have the best refineries in the world. We have the best gigafactories in the world with Nordfold, the greenest uh, battery that they are trying to produce there. And if you look at the, the one example that I find striking was given by Mikael Staffas of Bolid and CEO. The nickel being produced in Finland has a CO2 footprint of five kilograms CO2 per kilogram of nickel equivalent. The average in the world is 39. In Indonesia, it's above 80. And what is the premium that they get for their nickel? It's 1%. So how can we survive? How can we survive in that context? It's, it's crazy. And, and the same for, for the, the batteries of Nordfold. If they're going to produce the greenest battery with the lowest CO2 footprint, the most recycled materials, and all of that with the green electricity being fed into the system, and there is no premium for that, then it can't work. So that's, again, coming back to this mine to clean tech value chain, where every single step needs to be accommodated through a political system, basically. There needs to be some kind of support that allows these different units in that supply chain to prosper. And as long as we can't sort that out, then we're going to lose to the Chinese Why and the you, Indonesians do you have any nowadays. Final comments, because I know that we have to close, otherwise, I'll get told off a lot um, in a bit. Any final thoughts, just very quickly? I think for me, actually, just coming back to the uh, question from the gentleman um, there as to what we can learn from some of these other regions. I was thinking about the Inflation Reduction Act um, as, as something we can learn from, not in everything, because it doesn't apply to, to everything, um, but the simplicity and the transparency of this package is, is, is remarkable and, and something we in the wind industry particularly really enjoy. Um, and of course, we have some great measures. Um, we have the EU Innovation Fund, which scaling of our industry is probably not the ideal way, but we have it for good R&D programs. Uh, TCTF is, is, is very good. Um, but the transparency, I think we can improve a lot, a lot on that. You, you really know what you get with the IRA. And I completely agree with the statement that we don't want a subsidized industry. And what the IRA also does is, is it tapers off after a certain point in time. So it, it allows to kickstart an industry, it gives a boost, and then it allows the industry to stand on its own feet. And I think that's a really important learning from uh, something like the IRA. We have 27 tax systems. Did you? Okay, okay. Uh, let's have one, tax one system. final, final comment, system. otherwise we might Quick comments, emergency. if I may. First to the jobs. Jobs are incredibly important, but the fear of job loss should not um, hold us back from doing the industrial transformation. The Green Deal, for me and for many of us, is an agenda for reindustrialization. but reindustrialization, as was said, is industrial transformation. Um, there is a region, there are regions in Europe, including one in this country, which has put off for too long the need for industrial transformation. And once you lose that, you stay behind for a very long time. That we cannot afford. 
Secondly, on the US versus EU, sometimes people say the US is subsidizing its way to climate neutrality, mm -hmm. Europe is regulating its way to climate neutrality. I think we need to come closer together. And there we count on the member states to make sure that there is a better pooling of funding resources at the European level, not all in the European budget, but so that we can combine these resources and to really give meaningful support to industry, those sectors that need it, to cover this green premium. That's essential. Mm -hmm. um, and thirdly, I should say, we in the European Commission are not in the business of local content requirements. That's not our policy. Mm -hmm. um, we are in the business of sustainability requirements or what Mrs. Vestager is calling trustworthiness requirements. So that is now what we're looking for. How can we define these criteria, these requirements, so that we give a premium to products that are produced in Europe because they meet certain sustainability or other requirements that we need um, and help our industry in this way. But local content requirements, that goes against our DNA. So not made in Europe. Well, no. listen, panellists, um, I think we could talk for forever on this. Um, we've only scratched the surface, but unfortunately the time is very much not just up, it's over. Um, so thank you all for your contributions. And please do stay around, because so, there have been so many questions um, from all the different, um, uh, you know, whether you're online or in person. People have been putting their questions on Slido. You, don't worry, you can clap in a second. Um, so yes, yeah, so please stay around so you can have conversations with the people in the room. I'm sure they'd really, really like that. But with that now... I thank all of you and I hand the floor to Axel Eggart. He's the DG of Europa to close us now, finally. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I must say it will be very challenging to summarize this in five minutes, but I will do my, my best. Um, I think I come back at the end to what our uh, president said, and I, I start uh, with uh, Maros Shevchovic, who said, steel has a key role to play. It is essential for many value chains and uh, the clean tech industry. So this is a very positive statement, and he sees that uh, we need for that Two or three things. The one is uh, the global level playing field that was repeated by basically all uh, the participants in the panel, uh, that we need uh, low priced energy to make it through uh, the transition, energy which of course is decarbonized, and we need to make sure that we have an industrial base that is resilient and can contribute to the strategic autonomy of the European Union. He says a real green transition is only really happening in Europe. And I think I would agree, but it was also said that others are trying to overtake us left and right, IRA, US, China. So we have to be very careful that uh, this is not happening. Uh, and then uh, the ETS revenues should be used for the green transition. And that was also reconfirmed by Kurt. So I'm uh, looking very much forward to see the right proposals for that. And we are, of course, happy to cooperate with you that this uh, funding or these revenues go into the industries which really want to decarbonize as, quick, as quickly as possible as, for example, the European steel industry. Then we have um, Kurt, you said, uh, you assume that uh, Ms. von der Leyen has a lot of trust in Draghi. I hope that Mr. Draghi will also have a lot of trust in uh, Ms. von der Leyen uh, and that his report will be a success uh, for, for all of us. Um, I come back to you a bit later. Uh, Tim. <laughs> because I have to go through my notes, it's the only possibility. Uh, Tim, you said uh, correctly that uh, we as European steel industry, we have endorsed the direction with which the Commission and the EU institutions have taken for the decarbonization. The problem is the way of the implementation, uh, which has a completely different speed compared to other regions. 
Uh, and that we need to change. We need this level playing field. We need a business case. This has always been repeated by, by the speakers. Your main quote, I think, was European football plays against American football. I think this is a very, very good uh, comparison for what is happening today and what we try to change. We need to play American football and the others should play European football. That may be better. Um, so um, then we have uh, Christian Boussoy who uh, said that uh, more pragmatism is needed to so, uh, support the transition, uh, that um, we need to refocus on the industry. Uh, only after the IRA, we started to work for the real needs of the industry. And I believe that is correct. There has been a wake-up call. And uh, we saw it that uh, there came out much more industrial strategic uh, thinking from the Commission since one, one and a half years. So this, of course, should also be implemented in the next nine months, and not only when the new college really comes into place in January next year, because before that they will not really work. So there is nine months which we must not miss. It's crucial for our industry and for the whole value chains. Uh, then uh, we have, uh, yeah, Kurt, uh, you said uh, Europe is on track. We have reduced emissions by 47%. That's perfect. But still, you have heard it has reduced production since 2008 by 50 million tons. Today, we produce 126 million tons. That's also a way how to reduce emissions. So that trend should be reversed. Um, the ETS revenues, I have mentioned that it was a really good statement. Uh, the IRA, you have agreed a wake-up call for us. Uh, we need industrial deal to succeed in the green transition. And that is what, what we think is the right approach uh, for the next uh, few years. Then we have um, had um, Peter Tom Jones. There are not many people who remember the life of Brian. <laughs> but I, I hope that uh, what you said, that this meeting will not be uh, followed by just another meeting on the same talks, that now the real action is coming in. Um, you said uh, what has uh, changed uh, in the Critical Raw Materials Act, 15 years. What we did, China overtook us in just one year in this. Uh, what we need is a long-term strategy from mining to clean tech industries. So we need speed, but also a long-term strategy to maintain and enhance full value chains for the manufacturing of products in Europe. And you also said that China is basically driving an electric Ferrari while Europe is driving an old time of its own acceleration. This was also a very good statement, which we will definitely remember. Um, then I have uh, here had, um, ah yeah, another nice statement from you was Maros Cevcovic speaks like Jürgen Klopp, but Jürgen Klopp, but Jürgen Klopp doesn't uh, play in the Champions League. But we want to play in the Champions League, so please, uh, that is very important for us as, uh, as an industry. Uh, then I had um, Vadia saying that the wind power package is fantastic, which probably everyone agrees, but uh, there needs stronger guidance for the member states so that the implementation becomes a success. No, I have to check where I have Siegfried um, somewhere in my notes. Yes, I'm almost done. Siegfried <laughs> uh, agreed basically on the team sport um, that we need to put together the connections, uh, charging of electric vehicles, affordability of the energy, cheaper energy. Um, we need to really execute and implement uh, the Green Deal, uh, and um, we need to have um, the Commission to look into 
uh, into issues where trade is disturbed or distorted, for example, by electric vehicle subsidies, but that this is not the essential. The essential is really the business case and the business environment in Europe. That was your comment on this. Uh, there was some disagreement on um, f combustion engines coming back uh, or, or not. Uh, so that uh, is also, of course, uh, of course, noted. And I have somewhere also a quote from uh, Peter again here, the tsunami is coming of electric, uh, <laughs> it's already there, the tsunami is already there, it is a su suicidal strategy if you go back to combustion engines. So I think that discussion will, will continue, but I think you have also been clear, secret that uh, we need some kind of flexibility to achieve the objectives, and maybe there are some some ways to combine these two uh, views. So um, now I would like, I hope I did not forget anyone, but I would like to come back to what our president uh, said in, in the beginning, and which is basically wrapping up, up what we need as for, for business case. First of all, we have spoken about um, abundant supply with uh, low carbon energy at costs with which we can compete. And that concerns not only steel, concerns the whole value chain, because we need somehow to be able to pass on the costs, and they simply go through, through the value chain. And that is, of course, a risk for the whole value chain if costs increase significantly in Europe compared to other regions. Uh, secondly is uh, the trade dimension. We have to look what is happening outside Europe. And it's not only on, um, uh, on trade distortions, it's also on CO2 emissions. How can it be that uh, the steel industry in other regions is adding millions of new capacity based on uh, very high uh, emission uh, technologies, blast furnace technology, which will lock in emissions for decades to come. And everything we are doing in Europe is being wiped out, basically, in few years' capacity additions in other regions. So we need to find also a reaction here with like-minded countries uh, around the globe to tackle this, this issue together with uh, steel excess capacity over capacity in the global steel market, which is basically, and the OECD has confirmed that last week, subsidized steel capacity additions create more emissions than a normal private business market. That is a, a statement by the OECD last week. Um, so the, the last point, uh, or the third point, is the financing, de-risking. Uh, Kurt, you have spoken about that. De-risking, extremely important. Uh, the funding uh, via ETS revenues, for example, is one route to do that, but we need also to sit together with the banks to see how this can be, can be done. And there we are also hoping that uh, some of the reports of Mr. Draghi, Mr. Letter, will, uh, will give you the right uh, information how, how we can do that. And the last po point uh, was uh, green lead markets. There is no green lead market in Europe for, for green steel. It is very difficult. To, uh, to generate uh, green premiums. Maybe for the premium class in the automotive you can do that, but uh, it will not be the 150 million tons of steel. So that has also to be tackled, public procurement, product regulation. There we are coming again. Regulation follows regulation to fix what has not been done right in the first place. So I stop here, and I hope that we will have a very nice discussion with the cocktail. And uh, I wish you then all a good way home, if you do not stay for the drinks. Thank you. Thank you so much.